Okay, so we are almost there with situational factors. We have one left to cover. Uh, so the final situational factor which we talk about is that of obedience to authority figures. So the authority figure, or having an authority figure around, is the situation, or the situational factor, which is going to affect how you behave. Now, I don't think it's a stretch for you to imagine situations where you behave differently because you're told to by somebody else. So school is probably the best example. You don't, <clears throat> by and large, uh, sit on your phone or swear or throw things around in the class because there is an authority structure and an authority figure there who tells you that you're not allowed to do those things. Now, you do still have your own free will. You can do those things, but because of the authority figure, there'll be consequences and, uh, and potentially punishments put in place which you want to avoid so you don't behave in that certain way. But what if you didn't need the threat of punishment? What if just having an authority figure on its own was enough to affect behavior. Seems counterintuitive, doesn't seem like that would have an effect. But actually, uh, through the work of several brilliant psychologists, we have come to learn a lot about obedience and that there's definitely more to it than you think at first. So first of all, just a couple of brief definitions. An authority figure is somebody with some kind of uh, power, the ability to do something to you um, now, authority figures come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. If you think about the people who have authority in your life, you can probably think of dozens. Uh, for example, your parents, if you are under, uh, if you're not an adult yet, your parents have authority over you. The police have authority over pretty much everybody. Uh, we've got politicians, for example, who have authority in their particular sphere. In a school, teachers have authority. The head teacher has even more authority. And so this is really ingrained in our society and in our culture. Um, an authority is often confined to a particular context. So for example, um, when you're in my classroom, if you don't do what, what I want you to do, then there will be a consequence. I can give you detention, phone call home, I can, you know, cause, I can do those things because you're in my classroom. But if I spot you out in the supermarket and see you doing something that you shouldn't be, there's very little I can do about it. I can't give you a detention for swearing if I see you out on the street because my authority doesn't uh, include that kind of context. Where an authority or the authority figure has legitimate authority um, in a context, then we would, you would expect obedience in that situation. So, for example, um, if the police uh, come behind you and put their lights on when you're driving, you're going to pull over. That's a legitimate use of their authority. Um, however, if the milkman doesn't like what you're doing and he uh, shouts at you to pull over while he's uh, driving along doing his deliveries, that's not legitimate. Okay. And psychologists are interested in both of these types of obedience to authority. But the main one that we are going to look at is where the authority is not legitimate. You're not being told to do something which is justified or perhaps even legal. Because that kind of obedience is the one that causes the most trouble and causes us the most concern in terms of us as a society. Probably the worst abuse of authority um, that most of us are aware of was what happened in the Second World War with the concentration camps. The Nazi party used their authority to, um, to commit awful, just unimaginable um, atrocities against certain groups of people. And that was not a, in some senses it was legitimate because they had political power and they, they kind of legally were backed up. But it was such an immoral thing to do that it kind of raises the question, when is it right to disobey authority? 
the Holocaust and the events that took place um, during the Second World War were of particular interest to a psychologist called Stanley Milgram. Milgram's parents had been Jewish refugees in the war. They'd emigrated to America afterward, and he was studying, um, well, was lecturing actually, he was a professor at Stanford University. And he was concerned that the type of atrocities that were committed um, could be repeated. He was studying in the 60s, and only 20 years after these things had happened, and he wondered if it would ever be possible for that to happen again. Was there something particular? Were the Nazis just all psychopaths? And, um, and it could never happen again because there's n no other group of people that would do something like that. Well, he, he didn't really know. And you can think about it and you can ask questions. And, um, but as any self-respecting psychologist will tell you, people are awful at telling you how they will behave in a situation. They generally tell you how they think they should behave in a situation, but that usually has no reflection on what they will actually do. And so Milgram knew that he was going to have to design a study. He, would, he was going to have to uh, develop some kind of experiment that would test his question and help to, to, um, to put his mind at rest. And that was exactly what he did. And it's a, a very famous study, just nicknamed the Milgram Electric Shock Study. Uh, you should pause this video, stick that in your YouTube search bar and find one. There are absolutely loads. Uh, there's a good one which is kind of voiced over by um, Philip Zimbardo, who was a, a contemporary. He's kind of a skinny guy with a, with a black goatee, so you can recognize the thumbnail on that one. Okay, so I'm hoping that you've watched that video. I'm just gonna give you a brief summary. Milgram designed a study in which he got a, uh, he recruited a participant. So he recruited an individual and he told them that they were coming to be involved in a study about the effect of punishment on learning. They were um, chosen to be the teacher in this scenario and a learner who was actually a confederate of the experiment, they were an actor, were taken into a room, they were strapped to a chair with electrodes placed on them and basically told if you give a wrong answer we're going to electrocute you and every time you give a wrong answer we're going to increase the voltage. The teacher that's the genuine participant, was then taken into another room where they could hear but not see the person and um, they were told to operate this shock generator and to read the questions out. Now, this shock generator went from like 15 volts to 450. The, uh, the mains electricity in the UK is 240, so, so half of that. And the shock generator was even labeled danger, extreme intensity shock, XXX, like, you know, it was made clear how dangerous this was. The teacher, so the participant, was even given a sample electric shock so they knew how painful it was, and they could hear the screams of pain from the person they thought they were electrocuting. All of these things you would think would stop a person from doing such an awful thing especially because they were part of a voluntary experiment. They could have just walked out. There would have been no consequence. The authority figure in that situation was just an actor in a lab coat. And so I would expect that obedience would be very low. Doing something which is awful, having to listen to the person screaming in pain, and actually you could just walk out if you wanted to, all of those should make us expect that only psychopaths would want to actually um, take this study right through. At a certain point, the participants stopped, uh, sorry, the learner stopped responding. And so for all intents and purposes, they were dead, or at least they were unconscious and we were just shocking their body. It was clear there was no purpose to the study at that point. And yet what Milgram found was surprising and shocking. He found that most, over 50%, of all the genuine participants um, carried on with the experiment and administered lethal shocks going all the way because they were told to by this fake authority figure. This result kind of shocked the psychological community, if you like. Only 20 years earlier, the Nuremberg trials had taken place where Nazi war criminals were executed for their role in the atrocities which were committed. The defence that they had made was, 
I was just doing what I was told. I didn't want to kill the Jews. I have no problem with them. I was just following orders. And it was, it was decided at that point that that was inexcusable and insufficient. And yet, less than 20 years later, Milgram had proven that reasonable, normal people, most of us, would have done the exact same thing. How can we explain that? Well, Milgram explained it. Um, by, uh, with a couple of terms. First of all, when you are acting the way that you want to, you're acting as an individual, he called that an autonomous state. Uh, you are autonomous because you're acting on your own. He said that when there is an authority figure um, involved, that we enter what is called an agentic state. In other words, we become an agent of that authority figure. And it's as though our own moral reasoning kind of goes offline and we just follow the uh, the instructions, because it's not our choice. So because we're not making the decisions, we don't really need to worry too much about the consequences. We're just doing what we're told. And, and Milgram found that even in his experiment, with all of those extra um, kind of factors which would make somebody want to stop the experiment, most people carried on. Milgram made it really easy for people to back out. This experiment was rerun a couple of years later by a psychologist called Hoffling. And he did this in the workplace. He had nurses make a home visit and call up a doctor to ask what medication should be prescribed. The doctor gave 10 times the safe dose, which was clearly labeled on the medicine bottle. And 21 of the 22 nurses who participated in the study administered this dose, which would have been lethal. Now, obedience was even uh, higher in this situation because it was a more legitimate authority structure. They were calling their actual hospital and they were speaking to an actual doctor and they knew that if they didn't um, obey the authority of their direct superior, there would be professional consequences for them. And so no doubt that played a role. Now put yourself in the role of a military leader who is getting orders from their superior that they need to ship Jews off to a concentration camp. Now, the authority structure in the military is even more strict, and you can literally be executed for failing to follow out the orders that you're given. So, it kind of turns the whole thing on its head. Rather than believing that they're all psychopaths and any decent person would have done something different, actually what this tells us is you would have to be an exceptionally moral person um, and have incredible courage to not do what was done. So just finally to kind of wrap up this obedience theory, um, first, of it's, first off it's important to know how obedience is different from the other social um, theories that we've looked at. So conformity in majority influence can have similar results, you know, a person behaving in a way they normally wouldn't. But it's different in that conformity, where the person changes their behaviour because they want to fit in. But that's done because they feel like they should they're not actually being directly told to, and there wouldn't be any consequence other than a social kind of disapproval for that. Obedience is where a specific instruction is given and um, failure to obey may result in a consequence from that authority figure. So that's an important distinction to make. Milgram studied this, found that there is a, a deeply ingrained tendency in almost all people to obey authority figures, even when there's no direct consequence for not obeying. Now that is obviously an important and useful thing. Our society would not function if people had no regard for authority figures. However, blind obedience, where we follow what an authority figure says without questioning and without challenging the, the legitimacy of it, um, is an issue and has led to awful things happening in the past. Now that you've seen this video, you've almost been vaccinated against it because if you, for example, were to be put in the situation of one of uh, Milgram's participants, because you have that extra layer of knowledge now, um, you wouldn't behave in that same way. And so obedience is important, but it also needs to be combined with uh, individual thought. One final factor that links into obedience is that of the actual leader or the 
uh, authority figure themselves. So we've talked about how there's like a hierarchy of authority, but beyond that, certain people have greater influence than others to, uh, to cause that obedience. Sometimes we speak of people who are charismatic leaders. There are some people who just seem to instill confidence in those around them. Hitler was one of those people. He knew how to rally people, how to get people's emotions going and how to motivate. He was a charismatic leader and that was why there was such a high level of obedience. Napoleon, back in his day, was another example of a charismatic leader. Somebody who was able to inspire people to do things that they normally wouldn't do and also demand people to do things that they wouldn't normally consider. And so the personality of the authority figure, as well as their actual power and influence, is also a factor in obedience.